Hello everyone, I'm Eric from Strong Medicine, and today in this series on oncologic emergencies, I'm discussing neutropenic fever. What is neutropenic fever? Well, put very simply, it's exactly what it sounds like, the coexistence of fever and neutropenia, or low neutrophil count. If you want to be more specific, however, fever in this context is defined as a single oral temperature of 38.3 degrees Celsius or higher, or a sustained oral temperature of 38.0 or higher for one hour. Regarding the neutropenia, there exists surprisingly little consensus on the normal range for neutrophils, though 1,500 cells per microliter is a commonly cited lower bound of the normal range. Although, the degree of neutropenia needed for this condition is most commonly defined as an absolute neutrophil count below 500, or one that is expected to drop to below 500 within the next 48 hours. The term absolute neutrophil count is only to distinguish this value from the neutrophil percentage, which is the percentage of white blood cells, which are neutrophils. In most U.S. hospitals, labs don't report the ANC separately, but rather clinicians need to quickly calculate it themselves by multiplying the total white blood cell count by the neutrophil percentage, which includes both the percentage of typical segmented neutrophils as well as the less common band neutrophils. Regarding the clinical presentation, obviously the chief complaint is usually fever. Importantly though, while there are many causes of neutropenia in general, neutropenic fever as an important clinical entity is predominantly seen in oncology and hematology patients shortly after chemotherapy, specifically occurring around seven days after the chemo was administered. In patients with solid tumors, the neutropenia usually lasts less than a week, but can last longer in patients with hematologic malignancies or those undergoing a bone marrow transplant. Moving to the pathogenesis of neutropenic fever, there are a number of contributing factors in its development. First is, of course, decreased white blood cell production. This leads to decreased phagocytosis of foreign microorganisms that might otherwise get cleared by the immune system before a clinically evident infection developed. There is also a decreased production of some inflammatory mediators, which contributes to predisposition to infection. A particularly common site of chemotherapy toxicity is the GI tract, where disruption to mucosal barriers can lead to bacterial translocation from inside the gut to the bloodstream. The overwhelming majority of patients on cytotoxic chemotherapy have an indwelling intravenous line, such as a PIC or port, which um, are predisposed to getting infected. And there is emerging interest in whether alterations of the gut microbiome may also be a factor. Established risk factors for developing neutropenic fever include older age, poor performance status, hematologic malignancy as compared to a solid organ malignancy, a variety of medical comorbidities, including cardiovascular disease and chronic kidney disease, low body mass index, meaning the patient is underweight, and a low baseline white blood cell count prior to chemotherapy. Frustratingly, in cases of neutropenic fever, a specific microorganism is identified in less than 50% of cases. When an organism is identified, the most common culprits are enteric gram-negative rods, such as E. coli and Klebsiella, coagulase-negative staphylococci, such as Staph epi, Staph aureus, and Pseudomonas. While there has been much written about the shifting prevalences of gram-positive versus gram-negative organisms in cases of neutropenic fever, both groups remain common enough that empiric treatment should consider all of the above to be possible causes. The diagnosis of a neutropenic fever is obviously trivial, requiring nothing more than a thermometer and a CBC with differential. The workup of neutropenic fever is much the same as working up any patient presenting with fever and sepsis. A thorough history, including a review of systems, a thorough head-to-toe exam, a complete metabolic panel, multiple sets of blood cultures, UA and urine culture, testing for COVID and other respiratory viruses uh, that are prevalent in the community, and chest imaging, with a choice between chest x-ray and CT depending on local resources, severity of immunosuppression, and suspicion for a pulmonary source. Additional diagnostics such as abdominal CT, lumbar puncture, and echocardiogram 
are not routinely obtained at presentation for all patients and are reserved for those with symptoms or signs suggestive of infection in the relevant location. The treatment of neutropenic fever is the most complicated facet of this topic. As I discuss recommendations surrounding treatment, you need to keep in mind that due to how common a problem it is, some institutions have specific protocols for treating patients that incorporate local epidemiology, antibiotic resistance patterns, and local resources. Whenever the following discussion differs from an institutional protocol, I would recommend using the institutional protocol. But the first principle is universal. In all patients with cancer presenting with neutropenic fever, antibiotics should be started immediately after blood cultures are drawn, meaning that they should not be delayed for other diagnostic tests, as each hour that antibiotics are delayed significantly increases the risk of death. Antibiotics within one hour of arrival to the emergency room is a common benchmark for quality care, but if you can get them into the patient sooner, you absolutely should. An important step in choosing empiric antibiotic treatment is to assess the patient's risk of serious complication or death using one of two clinical prediction rules. The first is called the MASC or MASCC score. I feel this is counterintuitive, but with the MASC, the higher the score, the better it is for the patient. The conventional cutoff is a score of 21 or higher, which means the patient is at relatively low risk of death, while less than 21 means the patient is at relatively high risk. The second option is the CISNE or CISNE score, in which the higher the score, the worse it is for the patient. The performance characteristics of these two prediction scores are roughly similar, though there are likely some circumstances which favor the use of one over the other, and there may be some circumstances in which optimal prognostication uses both. But these details are outside the scope of this brief overview. So now comes the question of choosing empiric antibiotic coverage. To do this, the patient must be categorized as being at high or low risk of clinical deterioration. You might think that the prediction rules I just mentioned fully account for this step, but in practice, they are just one part. A patient is typically considered to be at high risk if any of the following are present. They are already clinically unstable. They have active uncontrolled comorbidities, including severe mucositis or refractory GI symptoms. They have a hematologic malignancy. They have profound neutropenia with an ANC less than 100, or the duration of neutropenia is anticipated to be from longer than a week, or they have either a low mask score or a high CISNY score. If they are at high risk, next ask if shock or severe sepsis is present, as defined by at least one acute organ failure. In this case, very broad empiric coverage should be started, with expert opinion recommending either piperacillin tazobactam, commonly known as zosin, cefepim, miropenem, or imipenem, plus either an aminoglycoside or a fluoroquinolone, plus vancomycin or other anti-MRSA antibiotic. Anecdotally, I have never seen an aminoglycoside used empirically in this situation. On the other hand, if neither shock nor severe sepsis is present, only one med from the first subset of antibiotics is indicated, unless there is visible evidence of skin or soft tissue infection, or if pneumonia is suspected, in which case additional MRSA coverage would be appropriate. If the scenario is that the patient's overall at low risk of complications or death, but they are unable to reliably take oral medications, or if they have inadequate home support, they are still admitted for IV antibiotics with the aforementioned options of piperacillin and tazobactam, cefepime, miropenem, or imipenem. But if they are at low risk, can take and absorb oral medications, and have adequate support at home, including the ability to return urgently to the hospital if necessary, in that situation, one can consider oral amoxicillin clavulanate, also known as augmentin, plus ciprofloxacin, with four hours of observation in the ED, and if still stable, you can discharge the person to home with daily outpatient follow-up 
which might only consist of daily phone calls to check in regarding the patient's symptoms and home temperature. If the patient is discharged from the ED, if blood cultures subsequently demonstrate bacteremia, or if the patient remains persistently febrile for longer than 72 hours, they should return for admission. As I said a few minutes ago, this is just a general approach that may not be perfectly applicable to every patient or perfectly applicable to your specific institution. For inpatients, do not expect the fevers will immediately resolve with antibiotics. Remember, the patient's immune system is markedly suppressed and it's going to take longer to fight any infection, even with treatment. Among patients admitted for neutropenic fever, the mean time to defervescence is about five days for hematologic malignancies and about two days for solid tumors. Thus, the persistence of fever is not necessarily an indication to broaden or change coverage if the patient is otherwise stable. But do consider additional or repeat diagnostic testing, such as repeat cultures and a chest CT, especially if the initial chest imaging was just a chest X-ray. For high-risk patients who are still febrile after four days, without an identified source, it's common to consider starting an empiric antifungal at that point, but this practice is not universal. What should the duration of antibiotics be in neutropenic fever? If the source of infection is identified, continue until both completing the usual duration of antibiotics for this infection and until the ANC is above 500. And of course, the antibiotic regimen should be tailored to the identified microorganism. On the other hand, if the source is not identified, continue antibiotics until the patient is afebrile for at least two days and the ANC is above 500, although some experts consider stopping before the ANC is necessarily above 500 if the patient is otherwise doing well. There are two final major considerations with treatment. First, remove any central venous catheters in the presence of bloodstream infections if there is a clinically obvious line infection, the patient has endocarditis, the organism is either Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, or fungus, or if there is persistent bacteremia or lack of clinical improvement after 72 hours. And second, GCSF, also known in the U.S. as Neupogen, is sometimes given to patients presenting with neutropenic fever to stimulate the bone marrow to produce more neutrophils. Although this would seem to be a logical course of action, the Infectious Diseases Society of America actually recommends against this because the available evidence shows lack of benefit, while the American Society of Clinical Oncology guidelines state it can be considered if the patient is at high risk of complications. I'll conclude with prognosis. Neutropenic fever, particularly in high-risk patients, is a major source of cancer-related morbidity and mortality. Overall, among patients hospitalized for this problem, in-hospital mortality is about 10%. Specific risk factors for death include having a hematologic malignancy, significant comorbid conditions, organ dysfunction at presentation, and of course, shock at presentation, which is a particularly strong negative prognostic marker, conferring an approximate 50% in-hospital mortality.